Mounting evidence indicates that Doctrine and Covenants section 132, the purported revelation authorizing LDS plural marriage, was conceived and created fraudulently. Let's consider the source document itself. The Church claims that this man, Joseph C. Kingsbury, created the oldest available copy of DNC 132. As I covered previously in my video about the purported 1842 Whitney revelation on plural marriage, over time, Kingsbury materially changed his testimony regarding how the document that became DNC 132 was created. And yet, in Kingsbury's inconsistent accounts, he consistently claimed that he alone copied the entire revelation. Let's consider evidence that this, too, was a lie. The Kingsbury document, as it's called, consists of nearly eight pages of handwritten text, shown here. It seems that, upon inspection, the entire document does not appear to have been created by the same person. Of the approximately seven and three-fourths pages of total manuscript text, the first seven and a quarter pages appear to have been written by one person using brown ink, and the last half page of text appears to have been written by a different person using black ink. I added color overlays to give you a sense for the portion of the manuscript in the two different ink colors. Throughout this presentation, when I refer to the brown portion of the manuscript, I mean the text in the first seven and a quarter pages, and when I refer to the black portion of the manuscript, I mean the last half of the text on page 8 of the document that appears to have been added by a different person. Based on word count, the initial or brown portion of the manuscript contains 88% of the document, and the black portion contains 12%. The brown portion corresponds to verses 1 through 60 in section 132, with the black portion being the source for verses 61 through 66. So let's take a look at the last page, page 8, because it's here that the anomalies begin to show up. This is a close-up of page 8. At the top of the page we note that the ink is brownish in color. In the first five lines we see similar, consistently sized and shaped letters, but on the sixth line we see an abrupt transition right after the paragraph sign identified in the red box to what looks like a different color of ink, in this case black ink, as well as a new writing style that is noticeably smaller in size that uses much finer lines compared to the brown text above. Clearly, some type of break or change occurred in the creation of the document. So as we compare the brown text above the line against the black text below it, which was all supposedly written by the same person, some interesting differences emerge. For example, consider the shape of the letter Y in the words by and my on the first line of text, as well as in the word justify on the second line. Each letter Y has a long, thick tail, which is also present in a second occurrence of the word justify identified in the next line below. The author's formation of the letter Y with a long, thick tail appears to be consistent. Contrast that with the shape of the final letter Y in the word adultery in the red circle below the blue line. The same letter Y, used at the end of a word, supposedly written by the same person, is much smaller and without the characteristic thick tail we see in the text above the blue line. It's possible this might have been influenced by the author changing his writing instrument. Consider also the shape of the letter J. In the brown text above the blue line, we see that the initial J's used in the two instances of the word justify are formed consistently. Compare those two initial J's with the initial J in the word justified below the line. We can see that the J below the line is significantly smaller and has no lower loop like the two J's above the line. Overall, the black text below the line is consistently smaller than the brown text that precedes it. Consider another difference in letter shape between the brown and black ink portions of the document. The name Abraham appears often in section 132. Here, on the first page of the document, in brown ink, we see the capital A in the word Abraham is shaped like a pointed triangle. That same letter shaping pattern continues throughout the brown ink portion of the document. On page 4, we see these four examples demonstrating consistency in the writing of the letter A at the beginning of the word Abraham. And here on page 5, we see the same pointy triangle style in these six highlighted examples of the name Abraham. So now we have a pretty good idea of how the writer consistently formed the capital A at the beginning of the name Abraham. That's why this excerpt in black ink from the last portion of the document is significant. In both instances that the name Abraham appears in the black ink portion of the document, identified here in the yellow circles, 
the capital A in the name Abraham is rounded and not the pointed triangle style used throughout the Browning portion of the document. In addition to handwriting differences, there's also a structural difference that seems important. In the red circles, you can see the word and, which appears frequently throughout the whole document. In these examples from the Browning portion of the document, note the similarity in how the writer formed the word and with a final D that curves back to the left. This style appears consistently throughout the first part, or Browning portion, of the document. For example, on the first page of the document, we see seven examples of the same handwriting style used to write the word and. Further down on the first page, we see that the author's handwriting style for the word and is consistent, including the final letter D with the curve back and toward the left. There are 12 examples highlighted here. Throughout the first or brown ink portion of the document, the word and appears just over 200 times. In every single one of those instances, the word and is spelled out. And that's why the contrast with the approach used in the last or black ink section of the document is so significant. Back on the last page, below the blue line, in the black ink section, the word and appears 22 times. But in the black ink section with the new handwriting style, the writer almost never wrote out the word and using the letters A and D. Instead, he used a symbol that represents the word and, which is a handwriting variation of the ampersand character, in at least 20 of those 22 instances. In the first or brown ink section of the document, 100% of the 201 instances of the word and were written out using the letters A and D, while in the last or black ink section, in 20 out of 22 instances, the writer did not write out the word and, but instead used the ampersand symbol. This is the last portion of the last page, written in black ink in the new handwriting style. You can see that the writer consistently uses the ampersand in place of spelling out the word and in all but two instances. The first is this one, in which it appears the ampersand may have been used originally, but then someone edited the document by apparently writing the word and in very small, crowded letters over the top of the ampersand. The last one is the only instance in the last or black ink portion of the document where the word AND is unambiguously written out using the letters A and D. Note the conspicuous absence of the backward curving D at the end of this instance of the word AND. It seems highly unlikely that the same copyist would employ a consistent pattern of spelling out the word AND 200 times, and then, after changing his ink color, pen tip, and most importantly his overall handwriting style, use the ampersand symbol instead of spelling out the word in at least 20 of the next 22 instances. To reiterate, in the first or brown ink portion of the document, the word and was written out over 200 times and the ampersand symbol was never used. There was one editorial note of interest. I found this change made in the last section of the document curious. Apparently the writer originally wrote, quote, that they may have the souls of men, end quote, which was later changed to that they may bear the souls of men. That doesn't seem like the kind of error a copyist would be likely to make if he were writing down the words as someone dictated them to him, or if he had a document in front of him and he was copying word for word, since Kingsbury at different times claimed both processes were used to create the document. It seems unlikely that someone could easily mistake the word bear for the word have in either spoken or written communication. This seems like an editorial change to make a better word choice, which doesn't make sense as this is supposed to have been a word-for-word -word copy of a pre-existing document. One additional difference between the brown and black ink portions of the document seems worth mentioning. In the first or brown ink portion of the manuscript, which is where all these snippets come from, the writer spells the past tense word destroyed correctly five times, while at the same time incorrectly spelling the present tense version of the same word destroy as D-I-S-T-R-O-Y three times. This consistency throughout the brown ink section is notable. In contrast, in this excerpt from the final black ink section, the past tense word destroyed is no longer spelled correctly. Only in the black ink section, the author now consistently misspells the word destroyed twice after previously spelling it correctly five times in a row. It's also interesting to note that when the writer began adding the black ink section, he stopped following the left margin convention maintained in the previous seven and a quarter pages of the document, 
that employed a typical left margin and started writing each new line of black ink text very close to the left edge of the paper. Pushing the text out to the edge of the paper and employing significantly smaller text indicates there may have been concern about making sure whatever was going to be added fit onto the space left on this eighth page of the manuscript. So what content was considered so important that it needed to be tacked onto the end of a previously completed document? The black ink portion of the document, which added verses 61 through 66 to the end of section 132, exempts men who want to take additional wives from the law of Sarah, or the obligation to secure the first wife's approval. It reads, quote, Therefore it shall be lawful in me, if she receive not this law, for him to receive all things, meaning all wives, whatsoever I the Lord his God will give unto him, because she did not believe or administer unto him according to my word. And she then becomes the transgressor, and he is exempt from the law of Sarah, who administered unto Abraham according to the law when I commanded Abraham to take Hagar to wife. The claim that God commanded Abraham to take Hagar as a wife contradicts the Bible, which in Genesis 16.2 explains that it was Sarah that asked Abraham to have a baby with Hagar, quote, And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. I would guess there was concern that all the focus on Abraham in section 132 might embolden Bible-reading LDS wives to recognize that Sarah was the one that initiated Abraham's polygamous relationship with Hagar, and when Sarah was not pleased with the circumstances, Abraham told Sarah to, quote, do to her, meaning Hagar, as it pleaseth thee, end quote, after which Sarah dealt hardly with Hagar, who then fled into the wilderness. It was Sarah who initiated and directed Abraham's polygamous relationship. That would not work in Brigham's version of polygamy. So apparently, somebody got the black ink out and added more revelation. To me, this evidence bolsters the case that Joseph Smith was a true prophet who did not practice or tolerate plural marriage, and that after Joseph's death, Brigham and others manufactured false stories and documents to implicate Joseph in polygamy. One LDS woman's reaction to what she perceived as false revelation seems instructive. Kimball Young told the story of a fearful LDS man who hesitated to ask his feisty wife for permission to marry a second woman. Quote, Finally, he told her he had had a revelation to marry a certain girl, and that in the face of such divine instructions, she must give her consent. End quote. He obviously underestimated the discernment of his wife, because she announced the next morning that she had received a revelation to, quote, shoot any woman who became his plural wife, end quote. He remained monogamous. My hope is that we too might be wise enough to recognize false revelations when we encounter them.